again. This uh, is part of our, our continuing thematic focus on health and healthcare is one of our, our three areas of emphasis this year. And it's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker in, in just a moment. Um, the topic, uh, of course, of, of uh, marijuana use needs no introduction. It's been much in the news and in the air. Um, but uh, our speaker today is Stanton Glantz. Professor Glantz is a, uh, a professor at University of California, San Francisco, and, and um, he has a great uh, title. He's the Truth Initiative Distinguished Professor of Tobacco Control at UCSF. So um, we're all for truth. <laughs> so congratulations on that. Um, Dr. Glantz conducts research on a wide array of topics, including the effects of tobacco, first and secondhand smoke on cardiovascular outcome. He has the unique distinction of being sued, uh, at least indirectly, twice by the tobacco industry for his- It was directly. Directly and indirectly, okay, very good. Thank you for the correction. He's the author of numerous papers, literally hundreds, and several books, including one entitled The Cigarette Papers and another called Bad Acts, which is about the Department of Justice suit against the tobacco industry. Uh, more recently, he's been something of a naysayer against the movement to legalize marijuana. Uh, for example, several of his papers have shown that marijuana smoke may have adverse effects on blood vessels, and he'll be talking some more about that. Um, his background is that he has a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering and economic systems from Stanford. And uh, last but not least, he was my teacher in biostatistics in medical school. <laughs> Professor Glantz. Well, thank you. Yeah, the statistics class I, I'm still teaching, and uh, the number of people who've taken that, because I've been doing it forever, is quite amazing. I mean, my wife and I are backpackers. She wouldn't tell it to look at me, but I have, like, really good legs. And uh, we were up in Yosemite, out in the middle of nowhere, sitting by a stream drinking some water and these two guys came down off a off a cliff with all the ropes and stuff and all dirty and we're dirty too of course and they're they're like looking at me like really funny and finally one of them said are you Stan Glantz and I said yeah how do you know me he said, I took statistics from you so anyway so I I'm here to talk about marijuana and um, and I'm I, I'm not a fan of the war on drugs. I do think marijuana should be legal, but I think the framework in which marijuana is being legalized here in California and elsewhere is a framework designed to maximize business opportunities at the expense of public health. And and what we've been doing research on for the last couple of years is if we're one we're going to regulate marijuana uh, in a way where we were not throwing people in jail for using it, which has proven to be a disastrous public policy. How can we do that in a way where we avoid the creation of a new tobacco industry? And uh, the work I'm going to talk about is something I've been working on for a while. Some of the specific analysis of the, the, the laws and regulations here in California, I have two great postdocs, a guy named Dan Ornstein and, and Candace, um, oh God, my, I got up too early. Candace Bowling, who are both lawyers with health backgrounds, so it's like the perfect combination for working on this issue. Um, the irony, when you when you talk about tobacco and marijuana, and and the reason I got into this, by the way. Because I'm like a tobacco guy, but the but now in California the historic pattern of kids starting with cigarettes and graduating tobacco cigarettes and graduating to marijuana has been reversed. Now they start with marijuana and graduate to tobacco. But tobacco is legally accepted. It's legal. Nobody's thrown in jail for using it or selling it. Um, it's, it's increasingly socially unacceptable, and use is falling rapidly here in California. Marijuana, on the other hand, is illegal, at least at the federal level, but it's socially sanctioned, and use is increasing. And so my kind of overarching policy frame for all of this 
is we should be treating tobacco more like, or pardon me, treating marijuana like tobacco. So we want to move the policy framework for marijuana into being like tobacco. Now, the, the, the framing of the debate that, as it's existed has been pre predominantly around social justice issues, that we're throwing all kinds of black people in, black, in jail, black men and young black men especially, that we've created this underground criminal economy, that it's, you know, there's a lot of social injustice and, and bad things that are happening. And, and that's, of course, all true, although in California, using marijuana hasn't been a felony for a very long time. It, it's, it's now an infraction where you get like a parking ticket. And then on the other side, we've had the just say no crowd, which now Donald Trump, as of a couple of days ago, it's like, you know, he's now all going to run an ad campaign telling kids just to say no to drugs. For those of you who aren't old enough, this is Nancy Reagan, President Reagan wife who had this big just say no thing. So that's been the poles of the debate. And, and one thing which has been all essentially absent has been the health perspective. And, and, but the real dominant force now is big business. Because while this is being presented and thought about in terms of like a bunch of hippies who you know, want to use their weed and have a good time you know, versus the stodgy just say no crowd, the real policy force, the real thing driving the discussion now is, is the marijuana business. And, the, and, and, and businesses who see huge amounts of money to be made here. And when I think about where we are in marijuana, it's about where tobacco was in 1880. People had cigarettes. They made them. They took some tobacco and dried it out and rolled it up in paper and smoked it. The per capita cigarette consumption was trivial at the time. And then there were three technological developments that occurred in the last 20 years of the 19th century. The first was the invention of the cigarette manufacturing machine, which brought the cost way down. The second was the advent of mass marketing. And the third was the invention of safety matches, so you could light them without sticking your face in a fire. And, and modern marketing and modern product engineering uh, were, were really pioneered by the tobacco industry. And we haven't seen any of that hardly at all yet in marijuana. We uh, have, uh, do not have the same kind of high-tech marijuana product engineering that you have in a cigarette. I mean, people think of a cigarette as some ground up tobacco wrapped in a piece of paper. That is absolutely not what it is. It's a highly engineered device to deliver a meter dose of nicotine at a certain rate. And that's controlled by mixing, by controlling the mix of tobaccos, by the additives that are used, by the porosity of the paper, by stuff that's in the paper, by all kinds of other things. In order to maximize the dose, to maximize consumption, to maximize profits. And that hasn't happened with marijuana products yet. And if we end up with a large corporatized market, which is what we're on the way to getting, that is the logical next step. If you put yourself in the, in the shoes of a capitalist, and I'm not saying this because I'm like a leftist and I'm against business, but you know, a businesses are there to make money. And the way to make money is to maximize consumption. We've seen it not on just in tobacco, but junk food, sugar-sweetened beverages, a whole variety of, of products that create health problems. And then, you know, modern marketing with branding and, and, uh, and, and mass marketing, which is just starting. And then what comes with that is tremendous amounts of money to go across the street and influence the policymaking process to protect those corporate interests. So I think you know, when you're thinking about marijuana policy making, you really need to be looking ahead, not backwards. Now, one of the other things that makes marijuana a little more complicated than tobacco is there actually are some legitimate demonstrated therapeutic uses for cannabinoids. And, and uh, you know, there is good data that they can help with chronic pain, uh, with managing side effects of chemotherapy, with 
some aspects of multiple sclerosis, um, and then some other areas where there are there's there's some but more limited data. But these are like real benefits. But the problem is that the the way this has been presented to the public and to public policymakers is this is medicine, you know, and and so it's good for you, and at the very least it's not bad for you. And, and my kind of one-liner for the media is like chemotherapy is medicine too. And if I had cancer, I would want chemotherapy. That doesn't mean people should be using it recreationally, you know, or putting it out in flavored packs with, you know, gu in gummy bear chemotherapy. So, so, you know, there is, and if you look at the research, particularly on youth and young adults, one reason the use kids who would not think of picking up a tobacco cigarette or, or using marijuana because they think it's good for you or at least harmless. But in fact, since 2009, the California Environmental Protection Agency, which is just a couple blocks from here, has had mar marijuana smoke and enlist the Prop 65 human carcinogens, something you, you, you know, you, you know, it is car carcinogenic. And it has a whole bunch of adverse cardiovascular effects. And I'm not going to, this is from a review that just got published about a week ago in Nature. <coughs> and, you know, what this is in, in English is like it can create all kinds of irregular heartbeats, some of which could be fatal. Um, it, it's been linked to myocardial infarction, heart attacks, and sudden death. It has a bunch of adverse effects on arteries. We've done research at UCSF where we showed that a minute or two of marijuana smoke completely shuts down normal functioning of your arteries, which is like really important in terms of not having heart attacks and stuff. It's also really important in terms of not having erectile dysfunction too, by the way. And, and you know, this is just piling up and, and these are very, very serious questions. There's also a whole lot of areas where tobacco and, and cannabis policy overlap in terms of both health effects, um, uh, it, what the right interventions are to be used, what the policy issues are. And so these things, you know, there's a very natural confluence. <coughs> now, it, it, and I apologize for coughing, I'm just getting over the flu. But at UCSF, we have 90 million pages of secret or previously secret internal tobacco industry documents on the internet. Uh, it's, it, it's at industrydocuments.library.ucsf.edu. And a few years ago, and this is a great example of how research really works, we were doing a study looking at tobacco industry's efforts to influence the European Union and we stumbled into the fact that back in the 60s and the 70s, all the big cigarette companies were getting ready to get into the marijuana business. And so we ended up publishing this paper, waiting for the opportune moment, because what was going on in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a lot of talk, especially when Jimmy Carter was president, about legalizing marijuana and so the, the tobacco companies didn't quite know what to do with it. They viewed it as a potential competitor and also as an opportunity. And they ended up doing quite a lot of research to get ready to go into the market. And in the, then Richard Nixon came in with the war on drugs and they pulled back because they already had enough political problems. But this, this is an example of one of the documents we found from 1978. And here you can see, as medical pressure against cigarette smoking increases, there's little sign of similar pressure against marijuana smoking. And it's commonly asserted by our its supporters that marijuana has a lot of recreational value. And it's like, hey, we know how to make this stuff. I mean, if the tobacco companies wanted to be out there with like the most addictive joint on the planet, they could do that tomorrow. They know how to do it. They know all the technology. They know how to, you know, and they know how to market it. And you know, there. And if they didn't, there's somebody else who, if they had the corporate resources, could do it. 
So where are we, you know, what's the history here in California? Well, uh, marijuana was decriminalized in, uh, by an initiative back in 1975, I think it was an initiative, and then later reduced to an infraction, and that means it's like a parking ticket. So it doesn't end up on your record. Uh, medical marijuana was legalized by a voter initiative back in 1996, and there was some, some legislation to tweak it, but there was no, up until quite recently, no state level legislation. So it was really left up to the local communities who didn't really have the authority to engage a lot of the technical issues. But it was like, how are you going to deal with the farms? Are you going to look the other way for the dispensaries? You know, what are you going to do? But there was no integrated state level in engagement. And then last year, Proposition 64 passed um, to legalize adult use effective January 1 for recreational purposes, and to uh, which means that the state is supposed to have the implementing regulations in force in two months. And, and, and there's like this mad dash going on. And then a couple months ago, and I can never remember what this stands for, but the legislature passed a bill called MACRUSA that tries to rationalize the medical and the recreational markets and come up with an integrated regulatory strategy, which um, while there's some, some bad things in the bill, the, the general goal they were trying to accomplish I think was really good because having two separate markets with two separate sets of rules generates a complexity which is really bad. And I mean, if one thing we've learned in tobacco, it's that complexity is bad. It may, is, you know, the tobacco companies can afford, and these other corporations can afford to hire lots of lawyers to deal with complexity. Local governments, even state governments, have a much harder time, let, much, let alone individual people. So trying to come up with an integrated market is a good thing. But there's a couple, well, so what did Malcrusa do, or Malcrusa do? Well, it it, it, it divided the responsibility for marijuana up among three agencies. It created this new Bureau of Cannabis Control, which may have been in the initiative, I can't remember, as the lead agency. And this, I believe, is in the Department of Consumer Affairs, not the Health Department. And this is a department whose job is facilitating business. Uh, they're in charge of overseeing retailers, distributors, testing labs, other businesses. The Department of Public Health does have a limited role uh, to set standards for manufactured cannabis products, and I'm going to talk a lot about that, packaging and labeling. And then the Department of Food and Ag is, is there to, to monitor cultivation and to try to track the product. Uh, food and Ag's, their goal is making the agriculture, make, helping agriculture make as much money as possible. They are not a public health agency. Uh, the Department of Public Health cares about public health, but they have a very limited role. One good thing in it is it does maintain significant local control. And if you look at the history of tobacco, most of the progress in tobacco has been made at the local level because that's where business is the least powerful. You know, if you come up here to Sacramento, you can go do stuff in back rooms. You can make lots of campaign contributions. You can hire lots of lobbyists. Regular people don't see that. If you're at the local level, especially in the smaller communities, local people know the politicians. They show up at, at city council hearings and board of supervisor hearings and actually are close enough to see what's going on. And it's very interesting how this is playing out right now because in San Francisco, which heavily voted for Prop 64 to, to legalize recreational marijuana. Every time they try to open a pot store, the neighbors go crazy. So it's, it's like we have a situation where people are saying like, yes, we should not be throwing people in jail for this, but we don't really want it everywhere. And so I think that the substrate of public opinion that's out there is actually quite favorable for a public health approach to these problems if there was some leadership out there pushing for it. 
So when people think about, about cannabis products, this is what people usually think about. The plant, the flower, dry it out, grind it up, wrap it in paper, maybe put it in a bong. But there's also this all, whole range of other kind of manufactured products, and nobody knows what to do with these things. You know, there's very, very little data out on their effects and their health effects. And this, what happened last summer or spring was under Prop 64, the, the Department of Public Health and the, the, um, uh, the other, the Cannabis Board, put out draft rules for regulating these things, which we then analyzed and commented on. And that's going to be the basis for some of the stuff I'm going to show you. When, when Malcrusa passed, they was all got withdrawn. And we did put public comments in. I, I don't know how many other health people did, but we did, talking about some of the problems. And there's so little time between now and that January 1 deadline that the normal policymaking process, the normal rulemaking process, is not going to be followed. Normally, the government writes a draft rule. They put it out for public comment. Interested people on, you know, whether they're health people or business or whoever, the public gets to give feedback on it, and then the government agencies take that and use it to write their final rule. So there's a way to at least try to influence the process. What's probably going to happen now is they're going to issue emergency rules on January 1. They're going to take effect, and then they're going to take public comment and go back and talk about tweaking the rules. And that's going to be way harder to change because then whatever is there will be there. So the manufactured products, which are, are, are still a relatively small part of the market but have a lot of room for growth, are things where you take the basic marijuana plant and you process it by chemically treating it, by extracting things, Combining it with other ingredients, and then you know to create edibles or pills or salves that you put on, and and, uh, and and nobody really quite knows what to do with these things. They can have very high potency, <coughs> very high concentrations of THC, which is a psychoactive component in marijuana, and very low levels of cannabidiols, which are actually the things in marijuana that seem to be having the health benefits, not the THC, it's the CBDs. And the new strains of marijuana have been bred to keep the TH, raise the THC concentrations and reduce the cannabidiol concentrations because the cannabidiols also tend to blunt the psychoactive effects. And, and if you're manufacturing things and you just want to give people a good high, you want to take the cannabidiols out, which are the things that tend to have the good effects. So, you know, this is all just getting into, uh, you know, fantasy land. So what should the public health framework be if I was running the world? Well, one, like tobacco, is to have marijuana be legal. We're not throwing people in jail for it. We're not creating huge criminal justice problems. But we should actively discourage it. And like tobacco, the goal should be that nobody wants to use it. Not that nobody can use it, but nobody wants to use it. And we have been amazingly successful at that in tobacco. I mean, here in California, when, when the voters passed Proposition 99 in 1988 that raised the tobacco tax and created the state tobacco program, the smoking rate here was about 25%, maybe even a little higher. We actually had higher than the national average smoking rate. Well, today it's down to around 10%. The kid rates are very low. And among the 10% of people who are smoking, a third of them aren't even smoking every day, and another third of them are very light smokers. And so I think that last, last fall, the voters passed Proposition 56 that did a big tobacco tax increase and put a lot of money into reinvigorating the state tobacco program, and I think if it's implemented properly, we could basically be done with tobacco in four or five years. 
You know, I think we have so many, so so few heavy smokers left, so many light and intermittent smokers that a good hard shove and we'll be finished. It's a problem. And um, and so I want to, with marijuana, I would want, you know, there's a lot of product. Everybody old enough to remember Hulu, you know, this very popular product. You put it around your waist and you wiggle and it would, I could never do it. I'm like totally not coordinated. But, you know, that was like a huge, those were making like zillions of dollars. Now, like, nobody uses it. There's lots and lots of products that people, you know, try to sell that nobody buys. And I would like to see marijuana in that category. Let them try to sell it, but we're going to regulate it in a way to make, to reinforce the smoke-free norm, the use-free norm. And so, just like with cigarettes, if people want to go use them, in ways that don't hurt anybody else, let them. But, but not public use, not use in workplaces. We don't want it around. And then, and then the other thing we could do with marijuana, because it's a new product, is we could start out with the kind of high-quality regulation in the marijuana business that, that, that people have been fighting for decades to get in, in tobacco. And I'll show you some examples. <coughs> the second thing, and this again was really pioneered in California, is to view the tobacco industry itself as a disease vector. You know, when you listen to Donald Trump talking about the opioid crisis, he doesn't mention the drug company who created the opioid crisis, you know, by going out and getting the prescribing habits of doctors changed to be given out opioids like candy. And, you know, again, industry's goal in America, in a capitalist society, is to make as much money as possible. Okay, that is their social charge. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you've got to put up guide rails to keep them from, like, doing a lot of damage to people along the way. And, and then the, the, the other thing, which is another thing which has been a real hallmark here in California and elsewhere is active engagement of public health with the policy-making process. And I just haven't seen that happening in California on marijuana. I mean, we've been making our noise. Uh, a, a, a couple of small advocacy groups like Americans for Non-Smokers Rights have been involved. But the big public health agencies, non-governmental organizations in California, for the most part, have been hiding from this issue. And I think that's a huge problem. Another thing that's very important, and this is not the way Prop 64 is written, is that the marijuana prevention and control program should be not just directed at kids. If there's one thing we've learned in tobacco is that you cannot keep kids from smoking if you don't keep everybody from smoking. Wagging your finger at kids and saying, we don't want you to smoke, wait till you're a grown up, encourages smoking. And so we need a general market campaign to reduce marijuana use in the population as a whole. And the way we've done it in tobacco is hard-hitting mass media, comprehensive smoke-free and other public usage laws, taxes set to generate revenues to, to support that and to support the supporting research to make it better. And you know, another area where we could act in marijuana, and we've done some in tobacco, is to strictly regulate the advertising and marketing. And, and the place I would start, and this is something California could do if they wanted, is to require plain packaging and state-of-the-art graphic warning labels. Now, who knows what plain packaging for tobacco is? Anybody? Okay, one guy. That's because you don't live in Australia, New Zealand, Uruguay, England, and many other countries. And so if you go to Uruguay, and buy a pack of cigarettes, that's what it looks like. Okay, this is a plain package. Um, uh, and the, the, the other side has, has the brand. These are from New Zealand. And what they do, they have a standardized color, a big health warning label, plus there's more on the back. And then this is the brand and the brand variant. Okay, and I actually know the people in Australia, which is where this was first introduced, who did the research in order to pick the most aversive color. It's kind of a puke green brown. 
or diarrhea green brown and they found if they put a little more brown in it it looked like chocolate and if they put a little more yellow in it it looked kind of golden you know but you know this is how we should be selling marijuana in in California uh, in terms of the warning uh, you know so if you take this which is the right way to do it by international standards uh, and then you look at what's going on in Washington and Colorado, two of the first states to legalize. These warnings are totally useless, okay? They're, they're too complicated. They're written in language that's way above the reading level for most people, and they're boring, okay? If you look at Nevada, this is what they're requiring, okay? Which is not so hot. If you look at what California proposed in the rules, it's that, okay? You need a magnifying glass to read it. It's six-point type, okay? You all have computers. You know how little six-point type is? How many of you set your computers for six-point type to be the default? I mean, this is ridiculous, and this is what the state proposed. Um, another thing that's very important that we've learned from tobacco control is that you need to protect the policy-making process from corporate interference. And there is a global treaty on tobacco called the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It has 181 parties. There's only a few countries in the world that haven't ratified it, including us, of course. I think it's the United States, Indonesia, Somalia, Iraq, and maybe Uzbekistan. Um, but in the FCTC, one of the really important uh, elements in it is something called Article 5.3 that says the involvement of organizations or individuals with commercial or vested interests in the tobacco industry and in public health policies with respect to tobacco control will most likely have a negative effect. And so <coughs> the policy making, the tobacco companies should be allowed to express their opinions. But the policy-making process itself should be insulated from them under conflict of interest rules. Well, if you look at the advisory committee membership for the committee advising the state on marijuana, you've got you know uh, people from the medical marijuana industry. You've got people who campaigned for Proposition 64. You've got the alcohol industry. OK, this is not. Uh, a committee that's set up to have an arm's length relationship from the industry it's regulating. If you compare that with the comparable committee for the state tobacco control program, which is called the Tobacco Education and Research Oversight Committee, every single member of it is independent of industry. You know, and that's the way it should be. Um, if you look at the kind of prevention programs that are, are running, and this is the kind of thing called for in Prop 64, this one is from, uh, I can't read it. This is from the state of Washington. My teen would never smoke marijuana, but would she eat it in a brownie, you know? Why is marijuana illegal for you but not him? What should you say? Talk to your kids, okay? Talk to your kids. A nice, safe message. Industry loves it. You know, if you look at the, uh, uh, this, this is, a, a, this one here is from, where's this one from? Uh, this is also Washington. Don't wait to talk to your kids about marijuana. You know, like parents, you be responsible, parents. And, and talk to your kids. Well, if you look at the tobacco industry's so-called youth smoking prevention programs, okay, it's, this is what the tobacco companies tell parents. You've got influence. Use it. You can help your young person and your family be tobacco free by setting expectations and teaching them to just say no. Sound familiar? You know? Or, or this is another one, you know, like could your kid be smoking? You know, use your influence. Talk to them. They'll listen. Bullshit. Okay. These programs have actually been evaluated by independent scientists 
and shown to subtly increase smoking. Okay? And so the kind of public education that the states that have already legalized marijuana is doing are using all the same kind of messaging which we already know is going to actually increase marijuana use. And in fact, one of my colleagues at UCSF was in, in Washington or Colorado doing focus group interviews with people about the state's advertising campaign, their prevention campaign, and they actually thought it was being run by the industry to increase sales. So, and, and to run the kind of campaigns that really work is really tough because the tobacco companies know what works and they fight it. Well, what works? Like this is the, this is the California campaign, you know, about e-cigarettes. You know, the state was one of the first out of the box to engage the e-cigarette issue. The tobacco companies hate this campaign so much they put up a parody site that people inadvertently go to with pro-tobacco messages. Uh, this, this is um, uh, the truth initiative. You know, this is this is like a good message. Or the even the FDA. <coughs> you know, these are strong messages that are prevention-oriented and that are reinforcing the non-using norm. And that's what we need. We have people here in California who know how to run these. The state health department, they, they are like the world experts on unselling tobacco. Those kind of people should be running the messaging around marijuana. It's there, but do you really want to buy it? It's like icky. And reinforcing the fact that most people don't use it, empowering those people to say something. So where are we? Where are we now? Okay. Well, the, as I said, the draft rules were issued and then withdrawn, but it, it gives you a good idea of what's coming. And well, I already talked about this, and and I don't have time to go through all the problems in the rules, but I'm going to talk about a few of them, and that is the poor labeling standards, high potency limits for manufactured products, the a daily sale limit is way too high, and, and I don't have time to get into the details, but it allows law enforcement agencies to get, or agents to be in the marijuana business, okay? It's like ridiculous, you know? I'm out there enforcing the marijuana laws when I'm in the business. It's like totally insane. We, the postdoc working with me on, on this one issue, uh, Candace Bowley, has looked at every other state, and California is the only state in America that would permit this. It's like, if you want examples of how industry is totally dominating the policy process, this is both ridiculous and the best example of it. The other thing that's wrong with Malcruz is it undermines the smoke-free laws and norms because it allows smoking and vaping in cannabis retailer micro-businesses. You know, we don't allow smoking in bars anymore. And, and, and there are some restrictions on it, but they're pretty minimal. And it's also, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, they're going to allow outdoor use at county fairs and beer garden-like places. What better way to, to, to encourage use, you know, and to expose people like me to secondhand exposure? The warning labels they have are really crappy. These are, these are text only. There's no provision for pictures. There's no rotating warnings. They don't really cover the full range of health effects. And also, their way, the reading level is like way too high. I don't think there's any provision in there that they be in Spanish and other languages. Uh, they propose a that there be a universal product symbol on the tobacco or on the marijuana product, but that but but it's not very big. It's a half inch, and this is what it would look like. And and it says it has to be legibly and conspicuously displayed, so you could have this. This would meet the law's standards. Okay. Um, uh, a better way to do labeling, and we've been doing a lot of research on this in the context of tobacco. Is, is, to, is to use black on yellow, right? There's a reason road signs are black on yellow. They're the most visible 
people see them as a warning. And also, the, the, they should at least be 20% of the primary panel. The international standard for, for warning labels in the FCTC is 30% and preferably 50%. In Uruguay, it's 85%. And then in the plain packaging countries, it's, there's, it's most of the package. Uh, there needs to be rules that would prevent abusive product taxes where they're producing marijuana products that look like candy and other things. The, the language in the rules before, and I don't have time to get into the legalisms, but the language that was proposed, which is at the top, would still permit all of this stuff. It should simply say there's no packaging that appeals to children or imitates any non-cannabis product, period. Uh, and again, you know, having plain packaging is, is something we should do. And we do have plain packaging for some things. For example, prescription drugs, right? When you, when you get prescription drugs, it's in a plain package, by and large. The, the, and, and again, met, you know, marijuana is being promoted as a medicine. We should treat it as a medicine. We should have, you know, plain packaging, standardized packaging with big warning labels. And in fact, this is being used in Oregon already, and, and uh, it's a way to get around some of their pre approval processes. So there is a stand, this is a marijuana, uh, uh, one kind of marijuana from Oregon. And, and in Uruguay, and it's already too late for this, but, but they've legalized recreational marijuana, but they've created a government monopoly on sales. Growing can still be done privately, but all the sales are controlled by the government. They're only making two low THC varieties available uh, as flour, and they're requiring standardized packaging. You know, so this is not gummy bears. This is not candies. This is not colors. This is not putting smells in the packages that appeal to kids, which is a whole other thing. Uh, another thing is to, to regulate the product formulation. The, um, uh, they said that they're not allowed to do anything to increase potency and toxicity, including nicotine and caffeine, which is good, but they don't specify what form, and that matters. And, and what needs to happen is the state needs to pro prohibit all addicts that promote addictiveness or inhalation, things like caffeine, nicotine, menthol, and, and characterizing sweet flavors, which really appeal to kids. There's a huge literature on that in tobacco now. And, and menthol is particularly important because it's a local anesthetic. It makes it easier to in, ingest, inhale the food, or I mean inhale the smoke. And, and while nobody studied it for cannabis, it's almost certainly the case. It's a conditioned reinforcer for nicotine and cigarettes, and it, it's likely the same thing is true for other inhaled things because of the effect it has on your bronchial tree. <coughs> and, and also, we already know that menthol smokers are more likely to use cannabis, menthol cigarette smokers. So, you know, we need to get rid of menthol and prohibit all these tutti fruity and sweet flavors. Those have direct neurological effects. There's big literature developing in tobacco that they promote use. And in fact, San Francisco has now passed a law prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products. The industry is challenging it. They forced a referendum. But they know how important this is uh, uh, to the kid market. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here. But the, the right now, the amount of the THC that's allowed is very high, much higher than other states. I think we have to really worry about poisoning people. Um, they have products that like look fine, and when you take the you know some of these bombs and other things, you can put it on, and you can overdose without knowing it. Especially because some of these things act very slowly, <coughs> and then you should not allow anything that looks like food or you know. Pineapple dream concentrate. I mean, what more could you want, you know, to, to create problems? So, so why does California matter in all this? Well, it's it's been the epicenter of the counterculture movement since the 60s. 
It was the first medical legalization state or a major source of production. Uh, it, California is, I'm going to finish on time. California is like big and important. Everybody here knows that. Um, it's the largest medical legalization jurisdiction. And once the adult recreational market opens, it will be the biggest marijuana market in the world. Um, the, there's a huge number of users. It's projected to grow a lot. So what are the conclusions from all this? Absent strong regulation, I think we're going to see the marijuana industry increasingly resemble the tobacco industry in every way. They're going to be developing much more potent and dangerous products that are designed to maximize use. They're going to use very aggressive modern marketing and product engineering to do this, and they're going to be across. They're going to be using their political influence to avoid effective regulation and policies to reduce use. That we really need strong product regulations to avoid the health burden of this increased use. We need large graphic warning labels, rotating warnings, and plain packaging. We need aggressive action to protect bystanders, non-smokers. You know, if you don't want to use it, you shouldn't be forced to breathe it. And, and this stuff is there. And we, in San Francisco, they have a huge concert called Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. It lasts for two days. I live right near Golden Gate Park. And we went over there, huge, gigantic crowd. And you know there were just enough people smoking dope to give me get me wheezy outdoors. Okay, that should you know they announced at the beginning no tobacco smoking, and everybody applauded. It should be no smoking. And and one of the things we've learned in California is empowering the non-using people has a huge effect on social norms, much more so than arresting people and stuff like. We need a big public education mass media campaign modeled by, and I would have it run by, the California Tobacco Control Program. We should set tax levels to discourage use and use some of that money to pay to drive use down. We need to implement strong conflict of interest policies and laws and the policymaking bodies that are developing and overseeing the policymaking. That's very, very important. And in many areas of state government here, we have that. Uh, but so far, business interests have been dominating the process, largely by default, because the health people aren't showing up. And another thing that's really important is once bad policies have been put in place, they're very, very hard to change. We did a study looking at if you pass a bad local smoking law, or state smoking law, how long does it take before it gets fixed? The median duration was 17 years. So, you know, getting this right the first time, I mean, if you don't, you still need to work on it, but getting it right the first time is way better. And, and as I said, so far the big health groups have been silent, which I think is a huge problem. So that's, I more or less fit in the time. I'm very proud of myself because I usually my wife says some people breathe to talk, and I talk to breathe. So I, there's time now for questions. Thank you for your interest. <coughs>